Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Brad, Brad Embry, and today we're going to talk about inclusive assessment. Now, thanks to the hard work of my colleague, Everett Agibwa, most of you are likely familiar with the university's definition of inclusion. What you may be less familiar with is what this might mean for your teaching practices and for your assessment practices. Um, the, the, these are good things to be concerned about because this is, of course, going to be very vital for us as we move, in for, as we move forward. I discovered a, uh, a quotation that I thought might be useful for us because in good part, it does spell out the implications for inclusivity for our teaching and assessment practices. I think it spells them out quite well. Uh, I'll focus on the first portion of the quote. Uh, Inclusive teaching involves delib deliberately cultivating a, teach a learning environment where all students are treated equitably, all students have equal access to learning, and they feel welcome, valued, and supported in their learning. Inclusivity then aims to create a dynamic, communal, supportive learning culture that creates space for greater diversity of thought, and for collaboration. Inclusive assessment practice then is so much more than the simple evaluation of students. It means assessing student learning through a wide diversity of formats and in ways that are accessible to all students, regardless of cultural background, regardless of lived experience and regardless of ability. Because traditional ways of assessment um, don't always work for all groups of students and may challenge or may challenge specific groups of students. When we consider inclusive assessment, it's important for us to challenge the way we think about and talk about assessment. And we need to include perspectives that are that are other in some respects. And by that, I mean, I think that we also need to begin to explore what students think, what students need, and how it is that students are and have been impacted by our practices. Now, where do we start? Well, today we're gonna to start by identifying a few of the hallmark, hallmark principles that, that can guide inclusive assessment and its incorporation into the classroom. First, student learning is monitored and promoted through early frequent assessment and opportunities for feedback for learning. Second, inclusive assessment includes a blend of both quantitative and qualitative methods and data collection for evaluation purposes. All students can thrive if given opportunity and supports for learning. This is a fundamental belief that underlies all inclusive practices. Assessment uses multiple and varied methods. Five, student learning is promoted by formative assessment that encourage greater student self-awareness and self-regulation. And then last of these guiding principles that, that, that I'll, I'll, I'll bring to your attention, inclusive assessment includes opportunities for students to demonstrate their learning in different ways using different modalities. Now, over the next few minutes, we have about 11 left, uh, I'll discuss three of these principles, maybe, maybe three and a half if I'm lucky, um, and try to offer a few practical solutions, strategies to help you implement assessments that center inclusive practice. And we'll begin with the first item on the list of guiding principles. Student learning is monitored, promoted through early, frequent assessment and opportunities for feedback for learning. Assessment frequency. By increasing the number of learning and assessment opportunities, will, this will do a number of things. One, it will decrease the relative value, lower the percentage of course grade for each assessment. This may result in lowered anxiety levels that many if not most students will feel. 
Frequent assessment also encourages students to stay on top of things, uh, to consistently monitor their progress and their learning. Research also seems to indicate that, that frequent assessment can encourage students to have greater focus and possibly lead to deeper learning. And this is, this is because at any one time, students are encouraged to work with usually smaller sets of or limited amounts of material, of content, and to do it with a limited scope of activities. That allows students an opportunity to, to focus more holistically on the project, the task at hand. Frequent assessment also implies that students will be assessed earlier in the term. And this means they'll receive their feedback earlier in the learning process. So this will help instructors and students get a sense for how students are doing. And early assessment also provides an invaluable window, window for the instructor. They can begin to get bet, to better understand, to get a sense for the different abilities and backgrounds that are present in their classes. Now, some of you are probably saying, yeah, my, I have big classes and I'm sorry, but large scale assessments are the way to go. Uh, I have very few other alternatives. Um, I think that even with large assessments of the traditional kind, it is possible to integrate frequent assessment into them. Scaffolded learning or learning by installment plan are ways that we can do this. Breaking a large assessment into bite-sized chunks, um, spreading this out over a portion or a duration or a, a portion of your term, this allows students to get feedback at a numerous points along the way and to build towards the, the larger or final portion of the scaffolded assessment. Um, in the case of a written work, a written essay, uh, I don't think this is too difficult for most of us to, to, to imagine, right? A step one where we have a thesis statement and a tentative bibliography. A step two where we have an outline and a annotated bibliography. A step three where we get a draft and maybe for the final, the final project in its entirety. Um, breaking the project up in this way, again, allows students to get feedback to see whether or not they're on track. And if they're not on track, it's an opportunity for them to ask for assistance or seek guidance. But what about large stakes exams? Can, what can I do in that case? Well, I think even in the case of multiple choice exams, you can try and scaffold these kinds of things. One of the things that, that I've seen done that I've tried to implement in, in larger classes in the past was to create a pre-exam taster quiz. And this would mirror exam conditions, model the assessment types, the assessment questions, and it would give students an opportunity for explicit hands-on practice with the, type of with the type of assessment and type of questions I plan to use. Um, I found it was an invaluable opportunity, one, for me to see if it worked, two, for students to get feedback on, on their, their progress and to, to, to evaluate where they were in terms of their learning. Um, the taster quiz doesn't also, doesn't have to be an individual project. It's something that can also be done in groups or in teams or in pairs and students can work together. Uh, this is a great way to build peer-to-peer -peer support networks inside your classes. I want to talk just quickly about formative assessment in the context of, of this. Uh, frequent formative assessment throughout your course is, is, is invaluable. Again, much like with the scaffold assignments, breaking them up, uh, formative assessments allow students to get feedback, and it allows them to get feedback in a way that is non-threatening because the formative assessments are low or no stakes. Uh, it get, gives them that sense to, to assess where they are. Are they going the right direction, the wrong direction? And if not, it is an opportunity for them to be pointed towards supports either you put in place or that are in place at the university proper. One of the, the things that I want to talk about is, oops, one of the things I want to talk about is, is feedback. 
whether it's a summative assessment or a formative assessment, feedback is vital. And instructor feedback is something that, that should be a very effective means for communicating for your students how it is they may improve um, in terms of you know, current work as well as future facing work. So I, I pause here because I know that there are probably are some of you out there are thinking that, you know, I, I don't understand my students. They never, they don't seem to follow my, my suggestions. They don't, they don't read my feedback. Um, and I too have encountered this situation before and have been puzzled by it. But I think one of the reasons for that is that there is not a shared, shared feedback literacy with respect to, I think that sometimes students are puzzled by, troubled by the terminology and the criteria that we use when we are evaluating and assessing work that students do. So one of the things that you can do in your class, I think, is to explicitly discuss how and why you provide feedback to your students. Be clear, try to use inclusive language to reach a shared understanding of terminology, uh, your evaluation criteria, avoid academic jargon that may be unclear to students whose backgrounds, lived experiences are different from yours. The next thing we're going to discuss quickly is again, and I'm reiterating here, inclusive assessment uses varied and multifaceted methods. So it tries not to depend on small, a small number of traditional high stakes assessment types. And why? Because measuring student achievement this way can possibly lead to inaccurate assessments, evaluations, judgments, especially when the learners you're working with, their experiences, their behaviors, their beliefs, values, they may differ or challenge an instruct instructor's way of understanding. In terms of inclusivity and equity, offering a variety of assignment types is the way to go. It increases the likelihood that each student can successfully demonstrate the achievement of course outcomes. Why is this? Because different evaluation types will more effectively accommodate the learning needs of a diverse student population. So the, the, the bottom line is give them alternatives. Now, I recognize that it can be difficult and time consuming to come up with alternatives. Um, and so I'm going to offer a quick, uh, a couple of quick ways, down and dirty ways, to think about opportunities for different assessment types. The first way is to differentiate assessment type as they align to your in-class and out-of-class activities. For example, you can use assessment types, individual and or group, that evaluate students for the kind of work that they're doing in and during class. That could be um, quizzes, short written responses, group-based activities, breakout summaries, these kind of things. And in the case of out-of-class activities, you can create discussion forums for them, take-home assignments, group and team project work. There are all, kind of there are all kinds of alternatives that, that split along these two lines. And so again, this is just a, a, a simple way of conceptualizing possible alternative assessment types. Another way to think about assessments is to differentiate assessment based on the learning outcomes that, that, that are part of your course. The learning outcomes will, will suggest a certain range of assessment types. So does the learning outcome suggest that, that the assessment is going to be performative or performance-based? Is it a single deliverable or end product? Is the, is the, does the learning outcome suggest that the assessment should be process or related, process related or, or process driven? And so, you know, for a process related or a thing, I think of reflection pieces, journals, uh, portfolios in progress. Is it a deliverable or end product? Well, I think of the final paper, a final class presentation, um, group and project work. And in terms of performance-based assessment, nothing, nothing screams 
performance-based assessment better than a, a traditional exam or a non-traditional exam as the case may be. So again, this is just another way for you to possibly play with the idea of assessments and to think of possible alternatives, viable options that, that go beyond the, the traditional kinds of assessments that you've tried to employ in your courses. Where and when appropriate, try to offer students choice. Give them options with how they can demonstrate their learning. And this, this, this is also not just a assessment type, it also can speak to mode. How are they going to communicate their learning? So you can ask students to consider different communication modalities to demonstrate their knowledge and development. Um, it could be text-based, it could be web-based, it could be illustration-based, oral, video, audio recordings. There are all kinds of options that are, are available to us now. And so this is one thing that, that you can consider when, when, you, when we encounter students or groups of students who are challenged by traditional kinds of work. So if the assessment is writing-based, perhaps you suggest that students pair their written work with a complementary demonstration of their learning, um, an autobiographical response, an audio or video essay, maybe an interview done in the form of a podcast, a digital collage, if the work is more problem-based, we can encourage students to work collaboratively with their peers, maybe partner their exams with other assessment components, short projects, short presentations, student-developed study guides, um, demonstrations, maybe informative poster sessions that highlight key themes or topics in your course. There are all kinds of alternatives out there. It's just trying to find the time and the necessary energy um, to, to, to devote in order to, to support your students and, and their learning and development. And so that's what I'm trying to do, trying to encourage you to do today with our presentation. Um, <laughs> last, before I leave this, this slide, uh, still uncertain? Ask your student. It is possible if you give your student the criteria and explain to them the ex expectations for their, their learning, um, you can ask them how it is that they think they can best demonstrate their learning. Um, you might be surprised by, by, by what they tell you. I'm not trying to suggest that you try to implement all of the things that we've talked about today. Not at the same time and not in the same course. I think it best if you try to start small, try to implement one practice at a time, try it on for size, see how it fits. Does it work? What's the response of your students? What feedback do you get? And if at the end of the day, it works for you and it works for your students, you can then try to implement yet another practice and another practice. And in this way, you can begin to slowly expand your use of inclusive assessments in your teaching and in your courses. So I end with that. Thank you very much.